I've been with Homeboy Industries for about a year now. Um, actually, Friday was my uh, my anniversary to be at Homeboy. Um, it's been the best. It's the biggest blessing in my life. Um, I work with the with the youth. So when you come out of camp in juvenile hall, you got to be enrolled in the school within 72 hours. And those are pretty much the, the kids that I work with coming out of camp and stuff like that. The twist is you got to be enrolled in the school within 72 hours, but the truth is the school districts don't have to accept them. So it's a mission to try to get them enrolled in the school within the 72 hours from the beginning. Um, but for me, I feel like that's my, like if there's any job in the world I love is working with the youth. Um, that's like my, uh, that's like my passion, I guess you would say. Like, there was a while back that I had took a, a, a kid, his name is Daniel. And um, he had actually been uh, he had actually been in camp for like uh, for nine months no for six months and um, he had went to court and he went into court with cut off shorts on t shirt and the judge tells him not only do you disrespect yourself you disrespect me so go on and sit and go on and sit in jail for six months and think about this you know so he violated him obviously he did more than that you know so they sent him in the in the court so when he got when he get out of uh, camp um, he goes through Homeboy Industries. One thing about Father Greg Boyle that you guys seen is that um, he goes into like the he goes into camps and juvenile halls and he goes into prisons, you know. So um, that's where Daniel Monhan had had met him. So when he had came home, he had he had came through Homeboy Industries and he was trying to get enrolled into school. The school districts didn't accept him. The only school district would accept him in the area was ours, was our charter school. So we enrolled him, but at the time we didn't have no room. So he was actually working at Homeboy and going to school at Homeboy. So um, anyway, I have to give him in a progress hearing within 30 days. So I got to take him back to court. Well, at Homeboy Industries, one of the things that we do is we give you like clothes. Like you'll go in there, you'll have your little suit. If you're going to go like to, um, whether you're going to job interview, court, whatever it is, uh, women are trying to get their kids back, whatever it is, you're going to go in there and you're going to represent yourself right. And, and you're going to respect yourself. So we, give, we offer clothes and stuff like that. So anyway, I take him into, we go into court. And that's one of the things that I get to do is I get the opportunity to take him to court. So... I take him to court, and we're sitting there all day, right? And he's like, oh, no, this is all bad. When you sit here all day, they're going to violate you, you know? But I believe, like, in my heart, when you do the right thing, good things happen, you know? And um, so sure enough, we go in there, and we go into court, and the first thing the judge says is, we're going to violate you for nine months. And I remember my heart just dropped. And I look over at him, and he's already taken his tie off. He's already quit. Like, all right, I'm going back. And three reasons she was violating him. Uh, one, he wasn't enrolled in the school within the 72 hours. Two, he missed two days of work. And uh, three, he was around gang members. So they feel at this time they're going to violate him for nine months. And I look over at him and I'm like, are you going to say something? And, and he's not saying nothing, you know, he's just sitting there. So I raise my hand and the judge says, well, who are you? And I say, my name's Steve. I'm from Homeboy Industries. Um, you know, I'm his mentor. And uh, I take responsibility for some of those things that maybe are not, though what I don't understand is some things are not on record and I don't understand why. And she said, well, go ahead, feel free to speak. What do you mean? And I said, well, yeah, he's not enrolled within the 72 hours, but he is enrolled, he's just not in the school. He is enrolled within 72 hours. The truth is, every day when he's at Homeboy, he has to sit at Homeboy from 1 to 5. He gets off, off work at 1 and he stays there till 5 to do his work. And every single day before he leaves, he calls his probation officer before he leaves homeboy and has to call his probation officer when he gets home. Why wasn't that on record? And another thing that wasn't on record is we have paperwork that says the two days he missed of school, uh, he was over there at work. Well, he was over there with his daughter who's in the hospital. Why isn't that on record? And those gang members that he was with, those are his rival enemies. He should be commended for that, not disciplined for it. She looked at everything I said, and she said, I find everything you say to be true. She said, thank your mentor right here. He just saved you nine months of your life. You weren't going to get back. And that, that is the blessing of Homeboy Industries. We're each other's voice. What she didn't know was this kid had been shot when he was 14 years old. He had been shot when he was 16 years old. We didn't know for the first time in his life, he comes from the projects from South Central every day, takes a train all the way to work every day, and goes home. The people that he was going to give his life for are the people that want to beat him up because he don't show his face out there no more. His own homeboys that he loves are the ones that want to beat him up now because he's not out there no more because he's trying to do the right thing. What she didn't know is his mother has died of cancer and she's on her last stage. And the truth is, when she does viol if she were to violate him, he was going to turn 18 by the time he comes home. He's not from this country. So chances are he would never see his mother again. Those are things that, that we don't look at. It's just a lot of times we just look at the bad what he's doing, but not what he's overcoming or not what he's been through. And uh, I had the opportunity to take him home and um, 
on the way home, I was driving, and I drove him back to, the, uh, to his house and go grab lunch, uh, taking him home. And uh, on my way back, I have to go to home for I gotta, I gotta basically explain what took place in court. And uh, on my way back, I was down in Alameda, and right before I came to Homeboy, um, uh, I seen Dodger Stadium, and you see the lights, and we're on the hill right here. And I got real emotional, because I remember in, in that same situation, I remember being in that same court, and I remember the same thing. The only thing was that that was me in court, and the only thing different is I wasn't going home. You know, I was sentenced to life in prison. And for me, I never understood why. Because I didn't grow up that way. I didn't grow up hateful. I didn't grow up wanting to be a gang member. I didn't want any of that. I remember driving down, um, right before you go off, you head off to prison, um, we leave this place, and I look over, and uh, I see Dodger. I see the hill of Dodger Stadium. I remember taking a picture in my mind and saying, I'm never going to see this again. I remember thinking to myself, like I've seen a, do uh, a little girl holding her mom's hand, and I remember thinking, I'll never see that again. I remember the sky being gray, just like an ugly day. You know, I went to prison. I was sentenced when I was 17 years old to life in prison. And on my way all the way upstate, I used to always think, like, what went wrong? Because I didn't grow up that way. Um, I hated gangs. I hated everything to do with them. My, my mom, my dad, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my brothers, everybody was from the same gang as I was from. It wasn't about the gang. It was where we grew up at. My mother grew up in the same place I grew up at, so she ended up from the same place I ended up at. That's why I hated it. On the outside looking in, gangs, it looks cool. You know, you see respect, you see loyalty, you see love, especially if you don't have a family, you feel one. But on the inside looking out, you see it for what it is. It's a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, a lot of betrayal. Um, and I didn't want no part of that. I just, I just, um, my mom married my stepdad when I was two years old. My stepdad was already doing life in prison. My mom stayed with him for 32 years, so throughout my life, I always visited prisons. Um, you see, my, when I was young, my, my father was murdered before I was born. Um, my mom's sister was murdered when I was young. My mom's brother was sentenced to life without. And my, other, my mom's other two brothers were sentenced to, to a lot of time in prison as well. One of them had been shot seven times. So like for me, I knew that lifestyle. And, um, that was something that I vowed that I would never become. Like my weekends would always be visiting my stepdad in prison. And the only way I get away with it is if we go to the baseball field. If I had a baseball game, my mom would let me stay home. But if I didn't have a baseball game, I'd be stuck on, on the visit all day, Saturday and Sunday. And back then, when you used to get visiting, you get visiting five days a week. So like my mom would, wherever my father would be, my mom would travel and find him. And it didn't matter what job she had or, or what it would be like, she'd always go follow him. And we'd stay there until we ended up homeless, you know, and we didn't have nowhere to go. We'd go back to a motel, and then we'd go back to my grandma's house. And um, that, was, uh, that was something that I hated that. Um, like back in the days, in the, in, the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, gang war was at, like at its peak. So like most of my life, I lived with my grandma, um, whether my mom or my family be on drugs. Um, like my grandma, that was like our foundation. The only thing is my grandma was going through a lot of issues too because um, my, my aunt, which is her daughter, she was murdered in her bedroom. So my grandma would take alcohol. That's how she dealt with, um, with the murder of my, my aunt. But every time we go over there, everybody knew that house. So like we couldn't sleep on our beds. Like because of drive-bys and shootouts, we'd have to sleep on the floor. Um, like in the, in the outside of the house, the lights would always be on. And in the inside of the house, the lights would always be off so nobody could see inside. Um, and that's the way we live. I remember at night, I used to be afraid to go throw out the trash. They'd be like, Steve, go throw out the trash. I'll run out there and run back in, you know. And it was just a messed way to live. Um, and when I was 11, that's, um, that's when I just decided uh, that this is a way of life for me. Um, I was coming home from my baseball game. Um, same thing as always. That's, that was my passion. When things would go wrong, I'd go to the baseball field. That was like, that was my safety. You know, that was my dream is one day is I'm going to be the baseball coach and my wife's going to be the team mom, you know? We used to always get snacks and stuff, so I used to always love baseball. Um, my brother, he got from the neighborhood when he was 14 years old. Uh, 
he was 15 years old at the time, and I was coming home from my baseball game, and it was in the summer, and um, it was like a nightmare. They had told me they opened him up with AK-47, and they took his life. And from that day on, I became a follower. I shaved my head, and I said, this is my life. Um, and that's pretty much where it went down there. When I was 14 years old, um, my mom felt like she didn't want that for my life no more. She didn't want, um, she seen what happened to my family, and she didn't want that. So she made me make a choice. She said, you can stay here, and you can walk away, or you can leave now, but I'm not going to support this no more. I might have made my choices, but I'm not going to let you go down that same path. And um, I walked away. So at 14 years old, I lived pretty much on the street. I lived at my own place just to hustle, um, just trying to make things happen. This is like, um, this is like the greatest, I had read one time when I was in prison, it said the greatest tragedy in life is not one who dies young, but one who dies while still living. And uh, that's what I felt like inside, like my innocence had died. Throughout that whole time, I always tried to fight to do the right thing. And eventually, I just accepted that the wrong thing was a part of my life. So by the time I was 17 years old, I was involved with a gang murder. Um, I'll tell you how warped my thinking was. I, sat in, um, I used to sat in, sit in court every day. And um, I would see my victim's mother, and she would have a big teddy bear of her son. And she'd have a baseball pitcher. And I used to look, and I remember my ears would get real, real red because I'd get so angry. I'm like, he wasn't no kid. He was older than me. He was a gang member. He was bald-headed. He was tatted up. He wasn't no kid. And I had a lot of hate. And um, when, they, uh, when they sentenced me to life, they allowed her to speak. And I expected her to speak the way I felt. And she didn't. She said, um, she said Stevie, I forgive you for what you've done, for you not know what you do. But I want you to know what you've taken from me and my family. So you didn't just take my son, you took a father away from two daughters. So did you know my son got involved in gangs? He's not a violent person. He was just looking for love. His father was never around. That was his family. Those were he grew up with, those guys in school. Everything she started to tell me, she said, you know, his favorite sport is baseball. Everything she told me about her son, it was my life. Down to the same church my mother went to is the same church she went to. See, we were the same. The only thing is he lived on that side of the street, and I lived on this side. But I didn't see it. Um, I just had a lot of hate. And uh, one of the things that, uh, like, I remember in trial, they used to always tell me, you're real callous. You know, um, they say, you smile a lot. This is something serious. Why are you smiling? Because I'd always vow myself, but nobody knows as I vow myself, I would never cry. When my brother died and stuff like that, I'd never cry. And when they sentenced me to life, I felt like crying. But I wouldn't, so I smiled. That's the only way it would cover up my tears. I've done that my whole life. I'd laugh and I'd smile when things would hurt me. And when they would put papers in front of me, I would slide them back. What they didn't know is I didn't know how to read. And that was my biggest thing growing up. That was my biggest thing. Everything I've been through in my life, I can, I can accept that was a way of life for me. But not knowing how to read made me feel like this. I remember, uh, like, people used to always tell me, oh, Stevie, you're short, you got big ears. I'd be like, I don't care. My mom told me I'm handsome. You know, I used to think like that, right? But, like, if you make me feel, like, stupid, or you tell me I'm stupid, or make me feel like what I'm saying means nothing, I will flash. And um, when I ended up in, um, in one of the things that's, that's happened is uh, when I ended up in, um, in prison, uh, my friend, what I consider my friend, because you're in a cell and you're pretty much locked in six months at a time or three months at a time. You're pretty much in the um, best way is like a closet. And he had made me feel like this. He had made me feel stupid. And I got so angry, but this is my friend. But it didn't matter. I was just really angry. And I started asking myself, see, I didn't know that I got like this. I just know that I'm, I get angry when somebody makes me feel a certain way. So I started asking myself, why, where, why would I flash on my own friend? And I realized it's because I'm ashamed. So I told him, I said, hey, um, I want to tell you something. And he's like, what's up? And I just told him I don't know how to read. And for me, that was like the most embarrassing thing that I can ever expose. And um, he looked at me and he laughed. He's like, well, let's do something about it. it was a trip. It's like for me... One of the reasons I wanted to learn how to read is because when I left, my kids were um, three months old, and my other son, I didn't even know she was pregnant with him. 
So like when I was gone, one of the things that would have happened when I went to prison is that like I would have never been able to write. I would have never been able to read my kids' letters and stuff like that. And um, I remember one time uh, when I was in um, when I was incarcerated, my my um, my kids' mother sent me a letter, and I had them get it, and they had to read it to me. And it was um, my 14-year-old homeboy had been murdered in my son's bedroom. My kids' mother was in prison, and my kids were in child services. And that was the most um, hopeless feeling I ever felt in my life. Um, how can I be gone? Yet, everything still be the same. The cycle will still continue when I'm gone. And um, my mom is the one. See, what's trip about redemption is my mom had got her life on track that she got the opportunity to take my kids. So most of my kids consider, like, my mom their mom. Um, so that's why my kids ended up in a stay in child services. My mom had moved to Sacramento when I got sentenced to life before um. Before I made my choices, um, my mom had already moved away from the gang to try to protect my brothers because she didn't want them to go down the same path as I went down. So um, that's where they ended up going. So I picked up reading in prison. I used to read and stuff like that. And um, one of the things is, like, the biggest hate I ever had was towards my stepdad. Like, I felt like um, my whole life was that, um, was that my mom chose my stepdad over us. And um, that's what I felt. It was like when we grew up and everywhere we go, I felt like she always put his needs first. And I mean, we grew up on WIC, on welfare, on food stamps, and we didn't have to live like that. We chose to because she always chose to leave her job to go be closer to him. So growing up, I had a lot of hate towards him. I hated always having to visit in, in visiting rooms and spend my Saturday and Sunday. But it's crazy the way God works because... um. While I was in prison, I ended up being in Sally for five years. And that man is the one that changed my life forever. Um, see, I didn't understand. I judged him the way people would judge me. This is a man who was on death row. This is a man whose society said he deserves to die, but the death penalty was ruled unconstitutional in the 70s. So everybody on death row was released to life in prison. This is a man who committed multiple murders, and I said, he doesn't, my mom is, deserves better than him. But what I didn't know was that he had actually been enrolled into the military when he was a kid. I know that my, uh, my grandfather had been in the military 20-something years, and I know my grandmother was a teacher. So I didn't understand why he went down that path. To me, he didn't have an excuse for it. And he told me, it was first it was my mother that told me, why don't you ask him why? And so I did, and he told me the story that his, uh, his girlfriend, one day he had let his girlfriend use a car, and she went out, and she didn't come home. Two brothers had raped her, and they took her to an alley and raped her, and when he had found out what happened, he used to always go to court with them every day. And every day he would go to court and wait to see what would happen to them, but one of the brothers turned state's evidence against the other brother, and he got immunity. So my stepdad went hunted him down and put him in the trunk the way he put his wife and took him to or his girlfriend and took him to the same alley that he took his girlfriend and he executed him. And then he went and told his, ground, his mother what he had done and his mother said, go turn yourself in because that's what we do. We take responsibility for what we do. And um, that's what he did. And they sent him to the youth authority on manslaughter. While in youth authority and manslaughter, he met my, my uncle who has now who has life without. And my uncle became his best friend. And he ended up getting involved in gangs and youth authority. So when he came out of youth authority, he went right back to the neighborhood. What they didn't know is that my grandfather disowned him when he was in youth authority. My grandfather said, I'm, we raised you better than that. You're disowned, you're no longer my son. And uh, what they didn't know is that his girlfriend had committed suicide during that time while he was gone. She was left with scars on her face. But I don't think it was the scars, I think it was something inside. So within 60 days when he got released, he committed murder again, this time for the gang. And uh, they sent him to death row. Uh, he was given the opportunity to have redemption, which he didn't know at the time. And a nun had told him one time that, that he wasn't going to die, that God had work for him to do. 
And I felt like everything lines up for a reason. You see, even with G, G's like a, he's an awesome man, no doubt. He has a, he's got a heck of a vision, but it's everybody else that makes it possible. And um, that's what I feel like. It's like the people that have patience with you, that don't give up on you, and that keep pushing you. You see, I hated my stepdad, and I tried to push him away for so long. And then I ended up finding out that I loved him, and that my hate came from hurt, and I had a lot of resentment. Was, um, had I never crossed paths with him, I would never be home today. And that's the honest truth. He taught me to take responsibility. He taught me to understand that I'm not a monster, that I lived a hard life. And if I had the opportunity to do it differently, I would. I picked it up reading in, in prison. And after learning how to read, I got my GED. And one of the things that tripped me out was that I stayed in school all the way till I got incarcerated till I was 17. And um, what's crazy is I sat in school that whole time and I never got one credit. And I thought to myself, well, at least PE or something, you know, I was there. But um, I never got a credit. So I thought to myself, if I'm going to be in prison, I'm going to have to sit here anyway. I'm not just going to sit here. I'm going to do something. So I got my GED. And then, like, my whole thing has always been, like, why not me? Like, you always, like, for me, I always sit back and I see, like, good things happen to everybody else, you know? I said, why can't good things happen to me? So um, what I did is I just started, uh, I started trying to do more, and I was good with my hands, so I started doing air conditioning in prison, and I would do that for a while, and I got certified, like, an air conditioner. I got a completion, and then somebody on the yard said, this guy's a universal technician. I said, he's a universal technician. I said, yeah. I said, wow, why can't I do that? So it took me like twice as long, but then I became a universal technician. I, I put my paperwork in. They gave me the test from New York, and I got it. And I said, man, if I can do this, I can do anything. What's the trip is I started feeling better about myself, and I was in prison. Like I started feeling like, like I had some worth, value, in prison. So after that, I've always like been curious about, I've always felt like culture had a lot to do with my life. So I started taking sociology in there. Um, with that and with a lot of recovery, um, things started to change. And uh, I went to, um, I went to, uh, to a hearing and um, it was, um, was a man by the name of Anderson, who's a commissioner. And uh, he's a retired sheriff. And the man that sat next to him, the other commissioner, he was a he was a retired warden and those are the people I have to stand before sit before like a table like this to see evaluate me to see if I can come home I went to a psychiatrist I went through um you know you got the prosecutor in there and it's just a little table and me and my lawyer and um I went into this hearing and one of the things he had asked me he says Stevie let me ask you something did you know a murder was going to take place and I told him yeah and he asked me, um, did you feel bad for what you've done? And I remember like the clock, because throughout my years, throughout my time in prison, people used to always tell me, just tell them what they want to hear, or just tell them, just tell them. But I couldn't. Like for me, there's no reason to lie no more. I don't have nothing to lie about. So um, I remember it was so quiet, I could hear the clock ticking. And I was fighting against it, and I told him, no, I didn't feel bad for what I've done. Not at the time. Today I do, but at that time I didn't. And I remember he slammed the table, and he got so angry, and he told me, you're cold, you're callous, what's wrong with you? And he was angry. He, everything that I felt my victim was going to tell me is what he told me. And he said, and you think about what you did, and you come back in three years, and you think about it. But like to myself, I had nothing more to lie about. So I got denied for, uh, for three more years was the trip is I had a lawyer and sometimes you just don't know one person you just don't know like what one person is capable of my lawyer is like somebody that planted a seed in my life and like hope I see the hope because like when um I used to be a, when I would be in there she used to write me and she used to always she her dad did 18 years in prison so like she was like Stevie one day she was a student at the time she said Stevie one day I'm gonna be a lawyer and when I become a lawyer I'm gonna get you out of prison and, I, and she fouled her bar like seven times, right? I'd be like, woman, you ain't never going to be no lawyer, you know? <laughs> but um, like, that's what's crazy is because we've seen things two different ways. 
Like, she's seen it as, I'm up against it. I got such student loans, I got no choice. I seen it as, like, quit now and take another road, you know? But um, she didn't. And um, after her seventh time filing her bar exam, she, got her, she became a lawyer. And seven years later, she's the one that got me out of prison. Um, what's a trip is I was way up north, and I got transferred like eight hours away down south. So three years later, I have to go to this hearing. Every, um, every where you go, every region has a new commissioner. So like every region is, is different. So like before the day of hearing, this is now I've been like almost a little over 16 years in there now. Um, I go before this hearing, and she asked me the day before she comes in and sees me, and she says, I don't know what commissioner is going to be. And I told her, I think it's going to be Anderson. And she said, no, it's not going to be Anderson. And I said, well, I think it is. If it's Anderson, it's of God. She said, boy, it better be of God, because that man is going to bury you this time, right? But like to her, she's like, she just seen it as, don't worry about it, it's not going to be Anderson. But to me, I felt like I have nothing more to hide. I told my truth already, you know? So when the morning time came, um, they, um, we go, before we go into the hearing, I got to see my lawyer in the morning. So when she comes in, she like pale like a ghost. I said, what happened? And she said, Anderson's here. This is eight hours away, you know? And I'm like, it's all going to be okay. She's like, well, hopefully he don't remember you. I said, all right, hopefully, you know. So the first thing we walk in, and he says, he's the first thing he says, on, put on record that I denied Stevie uh, such and such three years, and, um, you know, he's come before me again. And I said, so I sat there, and the first thing out of his mouth, first question is, did you know a murder was going to take place, and did you feel bad for what you've done? And like everything, the clock ticked again, and everything in my life is like just pretend, fake, like you've done your whole life. You know, just tell them what they want to hear. Just go with it. But I couldn't. And I told them the truth. No. I knew a murder was going to take place, and I didn't feel bad for what I've done. But if I was placed in that situation today, ain't no way in my life would I ever commit no crime like that, or nor would I commit any other crime or intentionally hurt anybody. But at that time, the truth is, I didn't. At the end of my court, at the end of our hearing, what's crazy is the man didn't flash back at me no more. He just looked at me. At the end of the hearing, he said, um, he said, Stevie, I gave you every opportunity to tell me what I needed to hear. I gave you op every opportunity to get out the back door, and you wouldn't do it. Therefore, I know you're not the man you were. I know you've changed, because you didn't want to tell me what I wanted to hear, and you didn't tell me what you needed to tell me to go home. You just told me your truth. And for that, you're going home. I never cried until that day, <laughs> the whole time in prison. And uh, when uh, when I got life in prison, I remember I heard my mom scream, and I never looked back. But when I came, when I got home, I had to wait for the governor to uh, to approve me to go home. And um. When he did, I called my mom the day the day he, he let me home, and I said, Mom, I'm coming home tomorrow. The best feeling in my life. So my passion is to give other kids an opportunity to make it. Because most people in prison, you think, that are doing life in there, the truth is you think they're career criminals and they're not. One choice changed their life and changed many lives forever. Most people in there didn't even commit the crime. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong person, wrong car. But they were there. And sometimes they don't know what it is. And it's easy to judge. It's easy to say, you know what, he's a gang member. He deserves to be in prison. Look at him. Look what he's done. And what I question is maybe he's not so violent that he is broken. And the reason I say that is maybe we won't look so much at judging as more with compassion if we see that maybe he's not such, a, such somebody that wants to uh, hurt people as much as he's the one hurt. And that's the way I feel. I'm going to tell you, to get involved in gangs, I stood in a circle. And my friends, that I considered my friends, I let them beat me. 
And after they beat me, I stood up and I said, thank you for letting me be a part of you. Now I'll give my life for it. You tell me, and I'm not one, I'm of many that get stand in the corner and get beat by their friends. That's how we get initiated. Tell me somebody's not broken to get beat by their friends. Tell me there's something not wrong with you mentally to get beat by your friends. There's something emotionally already wrong with them. They're already broken. They're willing to do whatever it takes to be loved, to feel a part of, to feel valued. I lived off of my identity. Everybody in there, they'll tell you, like, what is, what is the biggest thing is respect. That's everything. People die for that every day in prison. And our twist is, is what is respect to us? To me, I had nothing to offer. I had no money. I grew raised by my grandmother. What is respect to me? Respect is my identity. It's what I stand for and what I'm willing to give. That's what was crazy. Is like, for one person, someone is sitting in prison for 20 years, you'd be like, man, this dude, he keeps his word. He's a loyal dude. He's, he's respected, you know? And that's crazy because he had left two kids for the last 20 years and they probably don't feel the same way about him. So really, what is respect? Those are things that I had to take a look at. And like for me, it's to, to challenge these kids and, and the youth is, is what's going on with them. A lot of them don't even know they're broken. Most of them are very defiant. And then the reason why is because they resent authority because they resent their own parents. And if they ain't going to listen to their own parents, they sure the hell ain't going to listen to nobody else. So that's kind of like what I, what I see today. One of the things that, um, that uh, I ask people, and I ask them a lot, is this. is like, say you had a car, and like in, in um, the Homeboy Industries, we have a lot of groups. So we work with youth and one-on-one, -on -one and you know, you got therapists, and you got so many people that, that like, to me, it's like even as a playing field. It's like we're not minorities no more, because minorities don't get therapists, and you know, and all these people that are willing tutors and willing to help you, you know? We kind of like, even. And um, one of the things I ask them a lot is, say you got a car, and any car you buy off the lot, this beautiful car, and you drive it, and you drive it and you run amok. You go through the neighborhoods, you get shot at, you pop the tires, you keep running though. Eventually they start, crack, windows crack and you're still going. The interior is getting burnt out and you're still going. You put the radio on, it blows out, but you're still going. And you're still going, still going, and finally the motor blows out. Boom, you get pulled over to the corner. And they get and they haul it and they take it in. And they go and get this thing and they, and they fix this car back up. They put new tires, put a new paint job, put new windows, put new interior, put the new radio in, get it all going. When you jump in, it will start. And they said, no. And I said, why? I said, because they didn't fix the engine, Stevie. I said, yeah, because they didn't fix the problem. A lot of times that's us because we don't fix the problem. We change the way we look, we change the way we talk, we change our haircut, we grow out our hair, but we don't change what's broken. And that's one thing that uh, we do at Homeboy Industries is we try to heal. It's about healing. This, is, um, this has been the most amazing ride of my life. Somebody told me the other day I had to pick up a kid. His, um, he, was, uh, he was 17, he just turned 18 years old. His dad said, I'm gonna be out, I'm gonna go, uh, I gotta go take care of some stuff. I'll, you're gonna have the house to yourself for the weekend. So his dad leaves on a, on, a, on a Friday. 35 days later, he never came back. He left his son there. What's the trip is uh, throughout this time, his son doesn't know how to cook. He's losing weight. Everyone thinks he's on drugs. He's losing weight. Drug test him, right? Because we drug test people at homeboy. The truth was, is he just didn't have no food. So sometimes he'd eat and sometimes he wouldn't. Yeah, he was starving, yet he wouldn't say nothing to nobody. He was homeless, pretty much, but he wouldn't say nothing to nobody. Until he seen that somebody had compassion for him. That he's felt somebody else's love. So he finally told me it's true. So we get him in a program. Get him out of the house. We get him in the program. I take him to court. We get him on probation. He got this job, he's going to school. What happens? He gets in a fight at this program. You're like, well, what the hell? You just helped this kid, you got this, this, and this. So he gets into it, and they call me at midnight to come pick him up. He's 18 now, they say, you know what? You gotta pick him up, he's getting this and that. He got all his bags, he wants to go back to South Central. And my friend tells me when I'm on my way over there, like, man, they work you at home, boy. It's midnight, and you gotta go pick this kid up, right? On a Saturday night. 
And to me, it's not work if it's something you love. So um, I went to pick him up, and he was mad as heck, and I ain't never going to be at this program no more. But the difference now is I understand what it is to be mad. I understand. He's hurt. He's frustrated. So I take him to my house. We sit there for over the weekend, comes down, and Monday he tells me, I'm ready to go back. See, sometimes you just got to have patience. And now he's back at the program, now he's doing his thing, and he's still going to school and he's still doing it. And I wonder how much, how often he was so frustrated is because he had no authority. He's been living doing his own thing. He thought a parent was cool, that he can do the right thing, and now he realizes that his parent just didn't care. And those are things that he has to deal with. You know, so it's like many, my, my message, I guess, would be that we just don't know what we can do in life. And we just don't know who it would be. The most people that ever touched my life, truthfully, would have been um, other people beyond my own family. Um, I know my grandma, she loves me to death. When I came home, she was, um, she was right there, you know. She had got a stroke, and she came in her, in her wheelchair, and she was right there, though. She was making sure that she was there. And she told me, I'm sorry, mijo, because I didn't give my best to you because of my drinking and because of the things I was going through. But, like, I don't hold it against her. I don't hold it against nobody. Uh, I think that's like the, um, the vision is to, it's not supposed to hurt to be a child. I have two boys, and um, they're doing a lot better. You know, one wants to be in the military, and one wants to be a doctor. But they're doing good. What's crazy is that's not the way it started. When my mom first got my son, he had came out of the child services. My mom takes him to Sacramento. His mom, I've got life. His mom, uh, his mom, is in, is in jail. She's facing a lot of time, and this is uh, he's uh, he's over there in the school, and he's in this classroom, and he's sitting there, and he's sitting there in this classroom. They're trying to have these kids read, and my son's sitting there, and he's not reading, and she has a first person read, the next person read, the next person read, and she asks my son to read, and he says, "I'm not reading," and she says, "Oh, why don't you want to read? You think you're special?" And he sits there, and he's looking at her. Well, she don't know is everything that's going on in his life. She don't know that today, she don't if his son, if her, his mom's gonna get thirty something years, that his dad's already got life. She don't know this. All she knows is that this kid got an attitude. So as they continue on, she starts going to somebody else, and then she comes back to him. She says, "It's your turn." And he said, "I'm not reading." And she said, "Okay, well then just wait." He started to tear up. You see, when he gets frustrated, he's like his dad. He starts to tear up. And as he teared up, she said, are you crying? That's all it took. Next thing you know, he flashed. He starts throwing the tables, the chairs, the kids in the corner. Everyone's trying to calm him down. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes it took because the principal came. They couldn't calm him. Though. They had to call my mom from work. Fifteen minutes it took her to come to get him to calm him down. He was broken. It was it. He had his point. But unconditional love. This is a kid that grew up that if you try to hug him, he'd be like, no, nah, girls do that. Don't hug me, Grandma. Don't kiss me. Girls do that. This is a kid when he was little that his mom already buzzed his head. Already set him up for that lifestyle. He was throwing gang signs at six years old, five years old. This is what happens when there's no nurture, no love. And this is a kid now that wants to be in the military. And nobody can tell him any different. That's what he's going to do with his life. And that's what the ama amazing part is, is when people are there. G, I'm going to tell you something about G. G, see my brother um, four years ago. And my little brother, that's like my idol. He's, um, being that I had life in prison, his dad, which is my stepdad, he had life in prison. My older brother, he's finishing up 16 years in prison. So you would pretty much think my little brother would go down that same path. And odds are, pretty much he probably would have. He had already fractured his hand in a fight. He had already been angry, already, you know, just same stuff, starting to be defiant. And G sees him, and he gives the famous words that he used to tell everybody in the projects. He used to say, um, if I can get you into school and move you over here and put you in another place, would you go? And my brother said, yeah, G, I'll try it. So G gets him, and he puts him in an all-boys school. My brother said, hell no, nah, I ain't going to no all-boys school, you know? But um, G told him, look at education as an opportunity and not an obligation. Just give yourself a chance and see what you can do with it. What's crazy is he started to go and so many people started to help. 
so many people started to guide him. And little by little, he started to do it. Um, this year, he graduated. A lot of Jesuit schools, Fordham, Santa Clara, LMU, they offered him uh, scholarships, but everywhere he put in is everywhere he got. So he also got Stanford, Yale, and Harvard. Imagine that. And you know what's crazy is he chose Yale over Harvard because he wants to study divinity. He wants to teach theology. He wants to be a little G. But that's a man that touched his life, and now his way of thinking is to touch other people's lives. And this is a kid that had the same choice. Had he went down the same path, ain't no telling where he would have ended up at. And that's what happens when opportunity is given. Will everybody take it? Probably not. But there's some will. All we can do is plant the seed. They had asked one time, probation officers that came in, the homeboy, and he says, well, we pick and choose which ones we're going to throw to the sharks, which guys we're going to throw in here in the homeboy and make them come, and which ones we're going to stay away from. Because some of them are just not ready. You know, they come in here, they're just going to run amok, they're just going to act up, they're not going to take advantage of opportunity, they're just going to come in here and mess up, so we won't bring them. And what we said is bring them all. Whether they're ready or whether they're not ready, bring them all. And yeah, they may leave, but before they leave, they'll get bit. They'll get bit with love, they'll get bit with compassion, they'll get bit with knowing that somebody is willing to be there for them, even when they don't want them to be. And when they go back, they, won't feel, they will never forget that experience. They may forget what you said, but they won't forget that experience, and they will be back. Because that's many times, that's what happens at Homeboy. People come in, and they say, this is not for me, and they leave. Months later, you see them come back, because they've already got bit. They know what it is now. They know what it is to have unconditional love, but also to be held accountable. I feel like that was the biggest thing that my time gone was with my stepdad, is as much as uh, we bumped heads in the cell, and we bumped heads a lot, was that um, he held me accountable. He wouldn't let me argue for my limitations. And that's the truth. And he allowed me to expand my vision. Most kids don't have a vision. They don't have goals. They don't have anything. You ask them what's wrong with them, they'll tell you 20 things. You ask them what their strength is, they can't tell you one. Because people have been telling them what's wrong with them their whole life. You're like your father. You're stupid. What's wrong with you? You're a follower. But nobody ever instills the power of what's good in them. So a lot of times what I do is we'll go into a room and I'll ask them. and say, what does it take to come from the lifestyle that we come from? What does it take to grow up with one parent? What does it take to stay away from the streets of the neighborhood? And they say it takes perseverance. It takes responsibility. It takes courage to tell people no. Now there's so much more than what they started with. And when you first ask them what is it that you're capable of, they'll probably tell you nothing. And those are the things that we do at Homeboy Industries. Um, I'll leave you with this. This is something that, uh, that's something that, that I believe in. It was a poem that... Uh, that I had read and I never forgot because it was my life. And it says, six humans trapped in a happenstance and black and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood or so their stories told. Their dying fire was a need of logs. The first woman held hers back. For on the faces around the fire, she noticed one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not of his church and couldn't bring himself to give a fire a stick of birch. The third man sat in tattered clothes and gave his coat a hitch. Why should he put his log to use to warm the ideal rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of all the wealth he had in store and how to keep his earnings from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from sight. For all he seen in his eyes was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this foretold group would only accept for gain. He'd only give to those who gave was how he played the game. Logs held tight and death frozen hands is proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They all die from the cold within. And that's the journey of recovery, of building them back up. Is it may have started with the circumstances of what you live in and what you're going around, but the end is internal, it's emotional, and that's what we have to work on. So I think that's the vision. If we see that they're hurt, instead of defiant, we may have more cast, uh, compassion than judgment. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, um, definitely I'll try to answer them. Emergency room. I work in an emergency room, and a lot of times we have just a little window of opportunity in terms of interviewing a client. And 
hoping to kind of plant that pebble in their shoe, so to speak, to maybe make some uh, different decisions. What, what would you suggest in terms of, like, what would be the most meaningful way to reach out to someone that is pretty defiant? I think, like, the most thing is what they, uh, I know for me growing up, um, one of the people that, that was in my life that, that made a major difference, uh, one I, well, I obviously I went down the same path, was I had a baseball coach. And um, I feel like everybody that goes down the wrong path is sooner or later at some time in their life, it's sad to say, but their parents threw up their hands. And that's the truth. Um, the ones who made it in my neighborhood uh, are the ones whose parents that would come at midnight and they'll be trying to hide from their mom. Those are the ones who made it. Um, but the ones who didn't are the ones whose family finally just gave up on them. It's like I've accepted it. And so one of the things, like, as far as us, I know for me, for growing up in that lifestyle, is I always used to push people away. Because I, like, I remember one time uh, I had a baseball coach, and he invited me to his house, and they would sit at the table and eat. And that was the most awkward feeling I ever had. You know, it was like sitting there and this table. I just wanted to run out the door and go, you know. And that's the way, eventually, like, he would come and this and that. And, you know, eventually I'd push him away, push him away, and finally he left. So my thing would be is to never allow somebody to push them. Don't let them push you away. Stay. Because that's at the end of the day is they convince themselves, yeah, they did exactly what I thought they would do. And they blame you for their actions. So my thing is to always encourage and say, I'm still going to be here. Regardless of what you do, whatever you feel, however you act, I'm still going to be here. Because my intention is to have your best interests at hand, even if you don't. And more than anything, it's what we do. It's not what we say, you know? And that's what I feel like we'll always remember is what people do. So that's what works for us because I, I come across a lot of kids and I, most of them are coming to camp in juvenile hall. That's the kids I work with. And all of them in the beginning, the first thing out their mouth is, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and then you go ahead and do your job. Like right away, they're already trying to create division. But like G always says, it's kinship. Is eventually you realize that we are the same, that our values are the same, that we want the same. We just don't see it yet. So that's kind of like what it's about. Little by little, patience. The fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Believe it or not, those are the things that really work. And eventually it grows on them. Um, I've been working with youth for a few years. I used to work for the, uh, for the same program for many years, but I was just, you know, doing the support in the office and I remember one day I heard somebody says oh you know sometimes I've been we've been threatened because we're working with probation youth foster youth and I remember being there and I go oh I hope I never had to do that and then one day years later I was told you have this opportunity you want to take it and I went like okay I'm so scared inside of me but I think I can see the possibility in each of them and I may be able to work with them. So I said, okay, I will take it. And so there I am, working with the youth, visiting and visiting probation youth. And um, unfortunately, I'm not working with them anymore because last year I passed, my husband passed away and I had to be with my little ones. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing is that I always been working with them, looking for that possibility. And the school, the school I went to was to teach us to work with all of the, you know, all the ages. And so I always go with the possibility, even if they rejected me, there will be something that I can find to connect with them. And I just had to share one case. And I said, I had this youth who never wanted to talk to me. Every time she would reject me, reject me. And then one day I said to the social workers, I really need your help. And I remember being on the phone, hanging out after talking to her, and said, I felt like crying because I was so hurt for her words. And then I reflect and I, say, reflect and I said, wait a minute, I had to do my job. There should be something with this youth that I had to work with. I'm not going to give up. So I finally, the social worker says, she's at home, go show up. I did. Very cold. She would not talk to me, do the paperwork, nothing. All of a sudden, a cat comes by and it goes on me. 
I'm allergic to cats. I'm not going to say anything. And I just made a comment about the, the cat, and that was the connection. She opened up to me. She happened to be one of the best students in the life skills class. So all I had to say is that working with the youth, all we had to do is, if there is this door that they close, find another one and find and keep trying, keep trying, because that's how it, what it was, it's been working for me. And they always come, there's times who come to me and I, why are you talking to me? Oh, oh, I just needed to talk to you, but if you don't want to talk to me, then it's okay. But they, they will give me the opportunity. And they'll abandon, they will give me a hug, and they will say, I will miss you. So thank you. Thank you for all the changes that you have done to your life. Like, like one of the th things is, is um, it is, it may take a long time for a child. Like my son, even though like had not having his dad ever there, he's still extremely insecure. Like that's just some part of his character now. He's, he's, he's like, you tell him something, he still takes it personal. It's, he's really insecure. But like it may take a long time to build on a child's character, but it just takes one split second to change their perspective and how they choose to look at something. I was at a lock high this, um, this last week. And I got to go over there and visit the kids there. And when you go in that place, I don't know if you've ever been there. It's in South Central, right? But let me explain to you a little bit about what you're going into. When you walk in, they buzz you in. And you walk into the facility. And then when you see, you would think you would see a teacher on the other side, like, you know, or secretary, somebody tell you what you, you don't. You see a sheriff. So the sheriff tells you oh, what class are you, what class are you going to, where are you going to go to, okay. And then you'll see a security guard who's going to walk you over there. And then you got the 9th, the 10th, the 11th, and 12th, and then they'll buzz into another door. <sighs> now you're into the 9th facility. And as you see people walking around, you see sheriffs. And you know what they're wearing? They're not wearing cop uniforms. They're wearing green jumpsuits, the way CDC officers wear, correctional officers wear the green jumpsuit. Same exact thing. The only thing different is they got a gun on them. And that's what they have in this facility. They keep their doors open so they, security can walk through and see everybody there. You know, I say that to say, when I walked in there, they were hardened. You know, what's he possibly going to say? What's he possibly going to do? But when I walked out of there, you could feel it was different because their perspective changed. And that's the beginning of change. It's what we view and how we choose to look at things a lot to do with how we're going to deal with things. And that's the opportunity of hope, you know? Um, so uh, I guess my question would be, you're probably talking to a room full of folks who are also working with the caregivers, the, the grandmas, the aunties, the foster parents, right? Um, how do you recommend we best invest in your grandma, in your mom once she was able to re rehabilitate? How do we invest in the people who feel broken down because they keep trying and keep getting disappointed and all of those things? Well, um... For me, I got a, like tomorrow, tomorrow I got the, we got the furlough, so I, tomorrow I got the day off, and um, I'm going to go to, uh, to visit my, to visit my cousin, she was murdered, and when, um, when actually her, um, her baby's daddy, he got life, he got life before, she ended up doing five years, and uh, we all got from the neighborhood together, we're all the same age, and when she was pregnant with her, with her, uh, with her son, Isaiah, one of the things was that um, she was pregnant while she was incarcerated, so when she had the baby, the baby went in. DCF. So she ended up in a, in child, the baby went in a, a child uh, services. And one of the things is, when she was pulling out, she, when she got out of prison, she got two jobs. She started to do things right, and she got her baby back. And that was like, that was her thing, but she still lived in the neighborhood. So uh, at, um, at 10 o'clock in the morning, she had Isaiah on the, on, the, on the passenger seat, and she was pulling out in the neighborhood, and she was, she was taking off to go drop him off so she can go to work. And they opened her up with AK-47. They took her life. And um, Isaiah had to go to child services. Her mother, who's been on like smoking sherm and you know on drugs her whole life, had, come, had changed. So now her mother is the one who raises Isaiah. And it's not. It's a community. You know, her, his, her mother is a grandmother now. She's a lot older. But it's everybody else that helps her along the way, you know. Takes her, takes takes uh, Isaiah out to uh, to go out and see things, you know. Whether he be going to the to the park, um, going places, doing things. It's a community. The teachers are really compassionate with them, you know, because he's getting older. 
everybody's doing it because he don't have his mother, he don't have his father, he don't have anybody, you know. So he has a community as well as his family. But I think like any, in more than anything, it's, it's just the love. It's just, I would say what separates a lot of things is consistency. You know, because sometimes people are there for you for the day, and sometimes they give you the greatest speech, or sometimes they'll, they'll tell you something, and then tomorrow you'll never see them again. I think it's just being consistent, consistent, consistent. And eventually they put their guard down. I remember my kids, when they would be at my mom's house, see, my, my, when my, um, before my, mother, uh, my kid's mother got incarcerated, um, like she would be at the house and she would take off for two weeks at a time because she would be on a drug run. So she would drop the kids off, like, I'll be right back. And she would walk off and she would be gone for two weeks. And she did that for a long time. So like when my brother, when he, uh, he would be around, he'd pick up my kids. He said one time he had them at my grandma's house, and he was in the house, and the kids were outside. He said, go ahead and play. And they were playing in the backyard. And every 10 minutes, he said they would run back in, look where I'm at, and run back outside. They wanted to make sure that he didn't leave them. You know, so it's like that. Eventually in time, when he seen that, that my brother never left them, they started to see the consistency because he was always there. Eventually they put their guard down. So I'll say the key is consistency. Is there any difference that you'd recommend in terms of working with um, young men versus young wi young women? Um, I don't really know. Like as far as women, I th I would say at the end of the day, it's still emotional. You know, obviously women is um it's really broken the same thing. Obviously they go down a different path. Whether it's drugs, like a lot of people, like I tell them like this, whether it's drugs, alcohol, gangs, however you look at it, right? A lot of people will say that's a problem. The problem is the drugs. Stay away from the drugs, stay away from the gangs, stay away from the alcohol, and everything's okay. My question is, well, why'd you start in the first place then, if everything's okay? And one of the things that, uh, that I talked about was, like, say somebody drank, um, say three people drank a six-pack. And the first guy drinks a six-pack, and he drinks his six-pack, and next thing you know, he's at this bar, and next thing you know, he's Casanova. And he can pick up on any girl in the bar. He got all the confidence in the world, you know? And the next guy, he drinks the same six-pack. He's the same size as me, but he thinks he's Rambo, you know, and he could beat everybody up, you know? And the third guy drinks the same six-pack, and he goes home and goes to work the next day. Is the problem so much the alcohol, or is the problem the person? The alcohol is the trigger, the problem is the person. And I think that's whether it's men, women, or whatever the situation is, the problem is still the person, the emotions and the character and things like that. So I would say that's probably the main thing, is where we're both on the same part. Does, does Homeboy Industries at all work with the families? I know they work with the children or the, the youth, but do they help with the family, as in therapy or working with them? Yeah, well, we have 44 therapists. Um, so one of the things we do is, that's what it's all about, is brain reconnecting. Some of the things we do is we got like programs like Baby and Me and stuff like that, where a therapist is there as well, but they bring the babies and the parents and a therapist, and it's a whole room, and it's teaching the the parents how to be a parent to play with their kids that it's okay and what's okay to do and what's not because a lot of a lot of people that come up from the lifestyle whether they like it or not just mimic the same thing they learned growing up so yeah there's a lot of uh, programs like that we have as well we also have a fatherhood program by a ran by a doctor who who brings people together and brings the parents together the fathers together also with the kids stuff like that well thank you very much <laughs>